Welcome back to Chem OG. Today we're going to take a look at a subset of stereochemistry known as relative configuration. And in relative configurations, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at spatially where substituents are with respect to a certain category of biomolecules, and they are carbohydrates and amino acids. Now, if you're wondering why it is that D and L only are used for carbohydrates and amino acids, it's because RNS configurations are actually much more recent and they're much more robust. In other words, they apply to many, many more scenarios than D and L configurations do. And so IUPAC nomenclature looks at RNS in preference to D and L because the biomolecules that we're looking at can have multiple chiral centers. And so D and L are only going to take a look at one chiral center within the molecule and assign the configuration based on that one chiral center. But R and S take a look at each individual chiral center and make adjustments as necessary. And so D and L configurations, specifically what they assign in carbohydrates, are the penultimate carbon, or in other words, literally meaning next to last. And so if we take a look at an example of a carbohydrate, here we have a six carbon sugar. So I have a first carbon here, a second carbon, a third carbon, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And when we number our carbon chains, we number as close as possible to the most oxidized carbon. So in this case, it's going to be carbon number one, carbon number two, carbon number three, carbon number four, carbon number five, carbon number six. Our next to last one is going to be that fifth carbon. And so we're going to base our configuration on whether the molecule is D or L based on the substituents and how they're oriented around only that carbon, even though there are multiple chiral centers on this molecule, specifically four. If I take a look at amino acids, when we assign D and L, it's going to be based on the uh, spatial orientation of the substituents around the alpha carbon. And the alpha carbon on an amino acid is the one that is immediately attached to our carbonyl carbon, and it's also to which our ammonium group and our R group and our hydrogen is attached. And so that carbon is this one right here. Now notice that while this is a chiral center, this is not the only chiral center on our amino acid. There's another chiral center over here, but when we assign D and L, we're looking at a very specific chiral center and that's pretty much it. So in terms of both of those classes of biomolecules, the ones that are naturally occurring in humans are the following. D carbohydrates are the ones that are naturally occurring. And we haven't yet talked about how to determine D versus L, but I wanted to make sure that you understood that our bodies in terms of what it is we can metabolize and what it is that we make, uh, we're only dealing with D carbohydrates and we're only dealing with L amino acids. That's pretty much it. And so one way to remember which one is which one is by using this mnemonic. Carbohydrates or sugars are delicious. D sugars are delicious. So it's the D version of carbohydrates that are naturally occurring. And then for amino acids, it's quite the opposite. It's the L version that's naturally occurring. So a good way to remember that is that's to say that D amino acids are deadly, which is not entirely true. But it serves the purpose of helping you remember that D sugars are naturally occurring and it's the L amino acids that are naturally occurring instead. So let's start off by taking a look specifically at amino acids. And we do take a look at amino acids. We'll notice the following, that the general structure of amino acid is such that you have a carbon that is attached to a carboxyl group. It's also attached to an ammonium. The uh, R group here is variable and implicitly on a dash here is a hydrogen. And remember, when we assign relative configuration, we're focusing on that alpha carbon as a possible chiral center. Now, L amino acids, not the D, but the L, the way we assign L amino acids is by noticing that the amino group is coming towards us. It's on a wedge. So when the amino group is coming towards us, that means that we have an L amino acid. If this amino group, on the other hand, were away from us on a dash, we would be looking at the D amino acid instead. So if we take a look at the carboxyl group and orient it to the right, the amino group is on a wedge for an L amino acid, the amino group is on a dash for a D amino acid. What about if we were looking at a Fischer projection instead? Well, if we're looking at a Fischer projection, uh, we're going to have the carboxyl group up top and an L amino acid is gonna have the amino group pointing to the left. Okay, so with our carboxyl group up top, the L amino acid is going to have the ammonium 
on the left hand side. If the ammonium were on the right instead, then we would be looking at a D amino acid. But since the uh, ammonium is on the left, this is an L version of this amino acid when we we're looking at a Fischer projection. So R and S are also assignments we can make to those same chiral centers. But the rules for R and S aren't based on whether an amino group is on the left or right wedge or dash it's based on looking at all four substituents so the absolute configuration gives priorities to all four substituents and for that reason we can't use the same methodology for assigning rns that we do d and l and it's not necessarily true that d corresponds to r or that l corresponds to s or some mixture thereof they use different sets of rules entirely and so whether d corresponds to r or not is going to depend on the priority of this r functional group and that varies from amino acid to amino acid so as it turns out, L amino acids are generally an S absolute configuration at the alpha carbon, except for cysteine. Cysteine is the only one who's R group because it has a priority that is higher than the carbon of the carboxyl carbon because it has a different priority. Its L version is actually R. So L does not always correspond with S, but it just so happens that most of the time, based on the R groups of the, amino, of the 20 amino acids that we see, the L version of the amino acid is an S configuration. The only exception to that is cysteine because its R group has a sulfur in it, and that sulfur is going to be a higher priority than any of the oxygens attached to this particular carbon. So of the 20 amino acids that our body either uses or takes in our diet, essential and non-essential amino acids, um, only cysteine has an R configuration. What about this other wrinkle that we spoke of earlier? So we know how to assign D and L based on the alpha carbon and spatially where the uh, four functional groups happen to be. But what about if we have more than one chiral center in our molecule? Let's take the example of isoleucine. And so isoleucine has a chiral center at the alpha carbon, but there's also this other chiral center over here. Now, this is an L amino acid, and I know that because the amino group is on a wedge, it's coming towards us. So the D version of isoleucine has to have an amino group that's going away. Now, if I go in the lab and I take a look at L isoleucine, and I take a look at its physical properties compared to this version over here, I'll find out that these two molecules do not have identical physical properties. Okay, they differ in their, in their physical properties. And that's because they're not mirror images of each other. So remember, the only time two molecules match up with each other perfectly in terms of physical properties is when they are enantiomers of each other. And these guys are not enantiomers of each other. They differ at one chiral center, the alpha carbon, but they don't differ at the other. So these guys are different from each other at exactly one chiral center, which makes them epimers, which is a type of diastereomer, but they are not enantiomers. And so if I need to make sure that I have a molecule that has the same exact properties as isoleucine, but it's different at configuration around the alpha carbon, then I need to toss this molecule out and I need to bring in a version that has opposite configurations at every chiral center. And that would be D isoleucine. Okay, because otherwise the molecule that I'm creating doesn't have the same properties as isoleucine, so I would need to call it something else. So the only way that I would have the D version of the isomer is if I have a pair of enantiomers. So the D version and the L version in terms of um, our biomolecules, and this goes for carbohydrates as well, they have to be enantiomers of each other. And that means that I'm flipping every single chiral center and not the specific one that gives me the name. So the reason that we call, or the reason that we differentiate D and L is based on where the amino group is, but you also have to make sure to in, invert any other chiral centers that happen to be on the molecule as well. And that portion is really, really important. So let's switch gears and talk about carbohydrates. When it comes to carbohydrates, let's take a look at a particular example. I have a, a six carbon sugar over here, starting with the first carbon, moving all the way down to the last carbon. And remember the carbon in which we're interested in is 
the penultimate carbon. And so at that particular carbon, I notice that the hydroxyl group that's available and connected directly to that carbon is on the right. And so when the hydroxyl group on your penultimate carbon is on the right hand side, that is a D sugar. So whenever your hydroxyl group's on the right, it's a D sugar. And you got to make sure that your most oxidized carbon is towards the top. Generally speaking, though, in a Fischer projection, that will be the case. So D sugars have the hydroxyl group on the right. Now, if we're switching to R and S, it just so happens that the D sugar is going to have an R configuration at the penultimate carbon. And that has to do with the fact that whatever carbon you have up top here is going to be a higher priority than the carbon down here. So the OH group is always going to be highest priority around this chiral center. This carbon is going to be higher priority than the carbon down here. And so for all D carbohydrates, it just so happens that you're going to have an R configuration at that penultimate carbon, which makes things, you know, somewhat easy to figure out. So let's take a look at our sugar one more time. And that structure that we had actually belongs to galactose. And in particular, this is the D version of galactose and i know that because at the penultimate carbon the hydroxyl group is on the right hand side now how does the l isomer of galactose look like well one thing we can do is we can switch the uh substituents on the penultimate carbon and this oh group make it on the left so if i do that i end up with this molecule now if i compare these two molecules together in the lab I'll notice that they don't have the same physical properties. And that's, again, due to the fact that I switched only one chiral center, but I didn't switch any of the others, which means that I have two molecules with different physical properties. So these two sugars do not have the same physical properties because they're not in antimers. They're not mirror images of each other. So while this sugar is an L sugar, there's no doubt about that because the hydroxyl group is on the left, it's no longer galactose. It's actually, as it turns out, L ultrose instead. And so in order to make sure that you have the L isomer of the same sugar, and that L version of galactose should have the same physical properties as galactose, what I need to do instead is I need to flip all the chiral centers. So to make the L isomer, we absolutely must flip all the chiral centers in order to retain all of the same physical properties. So instead of just switching the penultimate carbon, I got to switch this carbon and I got to switch this carbon and I got to switch that carbon. Every single chiral center that's there on the molecule must be flipped. And so now I have two sugars that have identical physical properties because they are in antimers. And that's something that's very, very important for you to understand that if you were looking for a version of the sugar that is the L isomer and that has the same exact physical properties, it needs to be a mirror image. And anytime you're making mirror images, you have to flip all of the chiral centers, not just one, not just some, but every single one. So we just spoke about assigning D and L when it comes to the Fischer projection, but sugars can cyclize. They can take on a ring form. So how can we know or how can we identify whether the uh, isomer we're looking at is D or L if we're looking at a cyclic sugar? Well, we need to identify the penultimate carbon again. That does not change. And the way to identify the penultimate carbon in a cyclic sugar is that it's one of the carbons that's attached to oxygen in the ring. So here's the oxygen in the ring. Here's a carbon that's attached on one side, and here's another carbon that's also attached to that oxygen that's in the ring. Now, of those two carbons, the one that doesn't have another oxygen attached to it is the penultimate carbon. So if I take a look at this carbon right here, this carbon has two oxygens attached to it, whereas this carbon is, aside from the oxygen in the ring, it's attached to a hydrogen, it's attached to a carbon, it's attached to a carbon up top. So this then is my penultimate carbon. Okay. And so the structure we're looking at uh, is D-galactose in its ring form. And if you want to identify uh, or if we want to verify that it's a D-sugar, it's the one that has the CH2H, CH2OH group um, up in the ring as opposed to down. And so the L version of galactose would not only flip each of these chiral centers, but it would also flip this chiral center as well. So in L-galactose, our CH2OH group would actually be pointing down instead of up. And 
those two things that I just said, in terms of identifying the penultimate sugar as being the only one that's attached to one auction inside the ring, um, and having the CH2OH group being up to identify the D sugar, not only works for Hayworth projections, it also works for chair confirmations as well. So if I take a look at the carbon that I need to identify, it's this one right here. It's the only one that's attached to the ring auction, but it's not attached to any other auctions. CH2OH group here is up. So if you take a look, this hydrogen is down and axial. This CH2OH group is actually up and equatorial. And so CH2OH group is up in the ring. That is the D version of this particular carbohydrate. And the same stuff also applies if we take a look at this orientation as well. The uh, penultimate carbon is this one, and you'll notice that the CH2OH group is coming towards us. It is on a wedge, um, and that is a way to quickly identify that you're looking at the D version of the sugar. So we took a look at assigning relative configurations, D and L, to both amino acids and carbohydrates today. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please support this channel by hitting the subscribe button and hopefully you like this video enough to hit the like button as well.